And how could you cheat on Oscar Isaac? Oh my gosh. On top of it all. <laughs> how badly do you want to get abducted? It's probably a six out of 10. Okay. Six out of 10 is pretty good. <laughs> Let me just set the scene for you. Would you prefer an alien landed in your backyard? Or would you prefer you were down a dusty dirt road out in the middle of nowhere and it lands there? Dusty dirt road in the middle of nowhere. Absolutely. Why is that? I don't know. The aesthetics. Like, <laughs> I have a pretty backyard, Like, but it just, it would feel, it wouldn't feel right if it was just in my backyard. Like, if I was driving to go camping in the middle of the desert, and a bunch of lights came out of the sky and like, you know, stopped in front of my car, that would feel so right. I would have to go with them. I, I'm with you there. It brings us to our alien movies today. Why it feels a little uncomfy to have aliens in your backyard. Uh, that's what we're going to call this one. The first episode we had, E.T., that is aliens in your backyard, in your house, but it's a little different. It was a little more kiddish where... The three movies we're talking about today, two at least, are a little more nefarious. The third with the potential to be nefarious, but it mm -hmm. comes out all right. Let's start with 2022's Nope by Jordan Peele. Did you see this yes. movie in theaters? No, I did not. I don't know why. I think the reason why I didn't see it in theaters was because I don't love horror films. And based on everything I've seen from Jordan Peele, like his movies are good. They're phenomenal. But I just don't love kind of thriller horror movies. And so I was like, ah, I don't need to see this. But then it wasn't until like significantly after that I was like, oh, I think this was an alien movie. And uh, then I was like, oh, I think I missed the boat on this. I should go back and watch this. Yeah, I was a fan of Get Out a little later than when it would. I, I didn't see Get Out in theaters. I did see it six months, seven months later. Loved it. Saw it twice. Then I went to the theaters and saw Us, which if you haven't seen is fantastic, but it is scary. When I saw the commercials for Nope, this looked like the scariest of the ones he'd done. And I also didn't know it was an alien movie. No one spoiled it for me. My sister was like, we have to go see this. And I will say watching it in theaters was so terrifying and good, but it was terrifying to watch on the big screen. So to anyone listening, if it, if it comes to theaters... Go see it, because the loud sound, the giant screen, it does make it twice as scary. But I don't know about you, I like this one. I think it's a good movie. That's so funny, because when I watched it, I was not scared by it at all. Really? Yeah. I guess <laughs> not the anticipation, nothing about it? No. Oh. I was just like, this is a movie. That. Like I was like, oh, Us, Us was a lot more scary. Us was like way scarier. Us was way scarier. Th this was scary. Okay, yeah. Not jump scare scary. This was haunting. My chest was kind of tight. And I was just, are these things up there? It was a moment where I was like, okay, maybe these things are hiding in the clouds. It was kind of a fun War of the Worlds-ish comparison, at least for me. No, that makes sense. Maybe the difference is I just didn't see it in a movie theater that was dark. And I was watching it in my room in the afternoon with the sunlight streaming through. And I was just like, I'm just watching a movie right now. I'm going to start watching a movie. You're right. That's probably the best way to dip our toes into horror. <laughs> our good friend Cole, who has been on here before, is always telling me, he's like, just watch Drag Me to Hell in the daytime. It's so much more fun. <laughs> and it is true. I watched Blair Witch that way, and it was easier to get through. Yeah. Wow. Watch Nope in the daytime. Daniel Kaluuya, amazing casting. He was fantastic. Kiki Palmer, better casting. Even yes. better. She steals the show every time she, she does. I remember when this came out during the pandemic, 2022. So we thought it was dumb, but it kind of wasn't, but it kind of was. Mm -hmm. I don't think it did amazing numbers at the box office. And rating wise, people didn't love it as much as the last two movies. Are you in a similar camp? Yeah, I think so. Simply because, I mean, there's probably a lot of reasons behind it, but like it didn't really lend itself. It didn't – I mean, okay, I, I don't like when movies hold your hand to, to, to yeah. like explain what's happened. But this one, I was expecting a little more than what they gave me. Like the whole story with the chimpanzee, I'm still not really sure how that connected to this story. I really have no idea why that was a part of it. This was a movie that after I watched it, I had to watch too many video essays, which puts you in weird territory. You wonder yeah. if you need to sign up for like – 
a protein supplement and salmon delivered to your house. Anyway, all the ads. Jordan Peele set out to make this movie about expose and about the cost to make movies and to have wonder and to have, I don't know, the beauty of misunderstanding things and spectacle. The monkey very much so was a little bit based on real events of there was a chimp, I want to say early 2000s or 2010s, like ripped its trainer apart and like tore one guy's whole friend apart. And it was like a performing chimp had done movies and all kinds of stuff. It's one of those stories that keeps popping up. I asked Siegfried and Roy about their tiger experience and you'll yeah. have something similar. But I know he was... Uh, per usual, doing some things about race and just saying, when you put an animal out there, when you put an actor on a screen and you kind of make this performance art, you never have to think about and rectify what it does to the creature, to us as an audience, and what we expect of nature. That we just kind of mess with nature and toss things around and go, ah, entertain me. And that's very much what the monkey was about. Yeah, no, I definitely saw that. When like, I mean, the parallels between that first scene having the horse there and then having the little chrome ball in front of it, and then it kicks the thing across the room, that you're dealing with something, you're trying to extract value and worth out of something, and you're not seeing it as in its wholeness and it's, it's in its integrity. And that that comes at, at the cost to the thing, to the subject that you're encountering. What that had to do with the big alien in the sky? I don't know. That's where, again, there's some little context clues. Like, I know they talk about before Gordy, the chimp, goes on stage for the show. Yeah. The trainer says, you can't look him in the eye. He gets spooked. Now, with horses, the same thing. You can't look the horse in the eye. He gets spooked. Now, the alien monster in the sky, you can't look at it, right? That was the whole kind of conceit of the movie. You had to look away from it. It's kind of... And I don't... I'm with you in saying, I don't think it's a perfect critique, and I think... Jordan and co got a little lost with trying to do fun things versus like connect really clear line of here's exactly what this movie means. But I believe the alien once again was, or the, not the alien, the creature in the sky was a story about like surveillance entertainment and staring and watching and wanting to watch, but not be watched. And how are we kind of taking advantage of these things? But it does get muddied. Oh, and if it hides in the cloud, we have digital clouds that have all of our information up there. Okay. I can see that. I and I want to say Stephen Young's character, Ricky Joop Park, which again, we, weird name, Joop. Yeah. Okay. Uh, whatever. He is kind of at the center of this, which is why there's that horrific abduction slash eating scene with him in which the spectacle becomes a devourer, if you will. Yeah of just wanting to show people and have a special ability. And some people kind of believe they're above the laws of nature. He thinks he can gather people here, put a horse out there and make this thing that he has no real control over perform for them and show he has his power. And then the only reason he survives the monkey is because he was staring at the shoe. He was looking away and the monkey was killing people. looked him in the eye. He didn't do that. But this time he stares at the creature in the sky and gets eaten like the rest of them. So this kind of like false sense of security in believing you're better than nature, believing you're better than the laws of nature, and yet it's just ego. Yeah. What you make of how essentially OJ and Emerald's whole point was to photograph the creature, that they were trying to – like they're running a failing business because their business is to have horses that show up in Hollywood movies and their business is on the way out – for whatever reason. And their whole thing is we're going to take a picture of this thing before anyone else can, even though it disrupts electromagnetic fields and all of our digital stuff isn't going to work. So we need to get a film camera out here. Like, did you buy that conceit of like, Oh, this is how they, they, this is how they get out of their line of work. I didn't love that aspect of it. I also didn't love the old white man cameraman that was like, such an obvious, like, here's your piece in the puzzle. It's exactly what it's representing. I felt it was a little odd, and I felt that if you're talking about the spectacle and how you can't wrangle it and whatever else, the idea that these two would then capitalize on it to escape their lower level of work was weird to me. I don't know. I didn't love it. That, for me, is where it kind of fell apart. 
other than some cool iconic scenes and chases, I don't love the third act of this movie, but mm-hmm. that's just me. I'll tell you, I love the Akira slide. Beautiful. Anytime that shows up in a movie, I just love it. And to see it done in live action with the flag streaming behind her on the motorcycle, I was just like, hell yeah, that's fantastic. I was imagining you doing the Leo DiCaprio meme of pointing popcorn <laughs> spilling out. I also <laughs> thought, and I know Jordan Peele's talked about it, the creature, which they refer to as Jean Jacket the whole way through. Yeah. The final form we see is directly based on Angel Evangelon. Evangelion. Yeah. Thank you. Neon Genesis Evangelion. Neon Genesis Evangelion. There we go. Yeah, he directly based it off of that anime and really? has no problems talking about it, which I thought was interesting. It's funny to know when like you've gotten some notes here or taken a little inspo, but he goes, no, no. This definitely comes from Neon Genesis. Okay, this is about aliens. How'd you feel about the creature? I felt it was less alien than it was creature feature. Definitely. Yes. I thought it was fun. And I think the idea the idea of the UFOs or crafts or unidentified flying objects, whatever they are being biological and not metal, is, I think, a fun add on the lore and the genre of what if it was just like a giant manta ray? After watching the movie, I did go look up, what does it look like when a manta ray eats something? It's horrifying. It is what happens in the movie. <laughs> or like when a, a shark starts to swallow a camera, you look in there, you're like, oh, it's just hollow and squishy and white and gilly, and it's really gross. <laughs> so I thought it was nice. I thought it was fun to kind of turn it up on its side and have this thing be a living creature and not piloted by some other intelligent thing. But for me, that's kind of where I got – I lost it a little bit because I think my expectations – I think I did the, the the sin of having expectations when I watched this. And rather than having the joy of having my expectations broken, I was just, oh, so this isn't really about aliens. This is just about a thing. And I was just like, oh, man, I was expecting aliens. But you've got like – you've got like the abyss and stuff which like – or even like Xenon of the 21st century, the old Disney Channel movie where like the aliens are more th- – I mean, and we're even going to talk about some where the aliens are not necessarily UFOs, yeah. but yeah, I don't know. It was just, I was a little let down by it. I think that's uh, all this contributes to why this movie wasn't as big of a smash hit as Get Out and, and, and Us. It was a little gray mixed up. He did something fun, but I think the issue was probably the budget and just knowing this movie had quite an inflated budget that it was going to be difficult to earn back in any way, shape, or form during the pandemic. Fun. I, I think it was fun. Did you like it overall? Was it fun enough? Yeah, it was a good enough movie. I mean, it's not something I'm like dying to go watch again. Yeah. But it was, it was good enough to watch once. Agreed. I've seen Us three times, maybe. Watched that recently within the last year. And that's still way more rewatchable than this one is. Yes. But still, yeah, still fun. Daniel Kaluuya, great. Kiki Palmer, fantastic. I hope this movie did for her what Get Out did for Daniel and just like revitalizing her career and putting her in other roles that aren't just the game show she's hosting or reality TV. She loves that too, but I think she did a really good job of being a dramatically comedic character who's just lovable and believable the whole way through. Yeah. All right. Nope. Alien in our backyard flying around the clouds. Don't look at it. Let's talk about one you have to look at, which I struggle calling an alien movie, but I guess it is. Let's talk about 1999's The Iron Giant. What a good movie, honestly. Like, this is, it's it's very Spielbergian. If we're going to go back to how Spielberg kind of paved the way for a lot of this. Very Spielbergian in its conceit. You've got a little, you've got a kid who discovers an alien out in the, the forest. It's a giant robot who was sent to destroy Earth but got knocked on the head hard enough that actually he's a good guy now. Kind of sounds like Goku from Dragon Ball Z and kind of pulls in some of the favorite, like the energy from like the Roswell incident because even the town is called Rockwell and it's kind of steeped in this Cold War energy that is just a kind of a fun, I mean, not that Cold War was fun, but the the kind of the, the setting and the concept is just, it's such a fun, it's such a fun concept. It's a fun concept. I like their inclusion of Superman without having it be too much throughout the movie. The yeah. idea of, I, I'm always worried, yeah, if an alien landed and watched our movies, they'd be like, all right, we're either going to get the hell out of here or we're going to just ice everybody <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. But the idea that this Iron Giant alien 
comes in contact with Superman being his first story of humans and aliens. That's a fun, benevolent way to kind of twist the genre a little bit. I will say this is a movie that I love the first time I saw and then I kept going back and yet it has never left me. How did a hit movie have a protagonist named Hogarth Hughes? In all the alliterations, we could have gone, why that one? <laughs> they almost like are self-aware about it because in the movie, it was the guy, the redheaded dude. Oh, uh, Dean, played by Harry Connick Jr.? No, not him. He's the, the redheaded guy who is okay. part of the government, um, who's like stays with him and his mom. Oh, oh, oh. I'm like, girl. look, Kent Mansley. Kent Mansley, yep. Yeah, so like Kent Mansley even makes fun of it. He's like, Hogarth? And I just, it's a very, it's a very timely name. It's like, there's certain names that are just old people names. And sometimes little kids get burdened with an old person name that they will spend their life growing into. And Hogarth is one of those names. Yeah. I mean, the weird part is I did a little looking because I was like, are there other Hogarths? And there are other Hogarths. Hogarth is a last name. There's a huge marketing company named Hogarth. So I just thought maybe they created it for this movie, but they didn't. I do have to mention, because it's my favorite calling card, there's another movie from a year before that also just has a weird-ass protagonist name, which is 1998's Roland Emmerich Godzilla, the American Godzilla, in which Matthew Broderick's character's name is Nick Tatopoulos. And no less than five <laughs> times in the movie do they say, Nick Tatopoulos, and they just biff it. Now, that's because one of the writers or producers, his last name was Tatopoulos, but it was so unnecessary to have in the film, other than like a personal, like a little, eh, that's me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know who knew a Hogarth, but good on you for putting it in the film. Hopefully that's the only Hogarth we ever have in TV and film. <laughs> I will say too, growing up and finally looking back at when IMDb first came on, realizing who all the voice actors were, blew me away. You have Jennifer Aniston, Harry Connick Jr., Vin Diesel doing his first voice acting, pre-Groot. He plays the Iron Giant. John Mahomey, Jack Angel, Bob Bergen, Chris McDonald. Just like a lot of good names all in this movie that kind of lent themselves to this fun story. And at least for me, I don't know how you feel, but it balances the drama and the comedy pretty well to where it's still enjoyable to watch as, as an adult. Yes. No, it super is enjoyable to watch as an adult. I think... My favorite part of this is the the tagline that you are not a gun. You can be what you want to be. Spoken to a robot who's literally a walking weapon. Gun. And uh, that's like, I think one of the most important lessons that, that we can like learn. Like I've just been watching so many movies right lately. They're like, Oh, the protagonist is out to get revenge. And somehow and I know we've kicked around the idea of doing like an episode on this, which is called the myth of redemptive violence. That somehow you can, there's this idea that we have in our heads that violence was done to us. Therefore, there's a certain amount of violence that I can do back and that will somehow equal the playing field or it will bring balance back to the world. Yeah. When the reality is that's just not the case. There's actually no amount of violence that you can do that will bring balance to the world. Violence is itself the problem. And so to have a movie where this thing, the Iron Giant, comes from, some unknown world from space and is clearly here on earth to destroy the earth, but happens to get knocked on the head and gets his first experience of earth and nature and deer and water and stuff through the lens of a nine-year-old is like, oh, I don't have to be a gun. Yeah. And his whole thing is, I don't have to be a weapon. I don't want to be a weapon. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what a great message for a movie. Yeah, I would love to talk about, and I hope for everyone listening, if there needs to be a trigger warning, I'm going to talk about suicide and PTSD for just a minute. The genesis of this movie is a book, a novel called The Iron Man. The author Ted Hughes talked about how he wrote the book for his children after their mother committed suicide as a way of comforting them and saying, you are. You don't have to be the weapon. You don't have to be self-destructive. It can happen at times, but what if there was some ambivalent force from outside to remind you that things are good and beautiful and, and calm and serene, and you can choose that way? And then you have the director of the movie, Brad Bird, who went on to do The Incredibles and Ratatouille and some of our other favorite hits, 
Brad Bird made this film as a memorial to his sister, Susan, who was killed by her estranged husband in an act of gun violence. And so his whole pitch to people in the studios was, what if a gun had a soul and didn't want to be a gun? And so that, like you're just talking about, the Iron Giant is a walking gun. What if a gun had a soul and didn't want to didn't want to live its purpose, its intended purpose? So at least for me, I've seen a lot of discussions and things like that of people showing this movie as a way to explain PTSD to soldiers coming back of, yeah. you may have been a gun. You do not have to be a gun anymore. That you don't have to be defined by the utilities which you are able to perform. Like you're saying, it you can choose to be whatever you want to be. You can choose to be peaceful and ignore your ability to enact violence. You don't have to fall into it. Yeah, and so two things. One, I think this movie also does a really good job of doing one of my favorite things, one of my favorite tropes, which is aliens come to Earth with a specific goal and then end up falling in love with Earth life and don't want to do that thing anymore. I see. I don't know if you've seen Steven Universe on Cartoon Network, but it's a very it's a very magical. It's a kids show, but it's essentially these aliens came to Earth and fell in love with what it means to live a simple life on Earth, and we're like, no, I don't want to kill Earth anymore. And then it produces a whole cosmic war, and you see this same trope shows up over and over again, and I just I love that trope. And then secondly. I And I think this is something that, as we're watching movies about it, aliens, the encounter between humans and aliens is a way for us to talk about what it means to be a human. And it's so clear that with Kent Mansley, who's the the FBI spook who's there in town, who's trying to figure out what is going on with the FBI or with the Iron Giant, he wants so bad to just have nuclear war with this thing. He just wants to kill it so bad that he even, like at the end gets the gets the submarine off the coast to fire a nuclear warhead at their location without even thinking that it's going to kill him as well. He just was so bent on it yeah. that he was blind to everything else in the way. And I see that that is so much that is so much a part of human nature is to be so hell bent on whatever our idea of justice is that we start being blind to how our pursuit of justice is in fact creating injustice all along the way. Yeah, reactive militancy is just never a good answer. Never. I think what's interesting to me is we have this movie in 1999, and a short two years later, some really terrible things happen. Uh-huh. And a short four years later, there are American boots on the ground in Iraq, of all places, and now we've been there 20-plus years, and here we are. It's interesting that this movie was so poignant beforehand, and I hope it's revisited by people now and it's shown to kids. It's not just been forgotten. Who knows what streaming service carries it these days or will in a couple of years? Who knows? But I agree. It's an interesting, palatable look at our own obsession with destruction as human beings. I do love that the general, though, calls out Kent at the end and like, what's he say? He's going to court martial him or something or put this man in jail? Yeah. Kind of a yeah. nice little twist where I feel like maybe movies these days wouldn't do that. It was just a one moment line, but it was nice for it to be a realization of put that man in prison. <laughs> we don't mm-hmm. need those kind of violent thoughts here, but yeah. Did you ever see Ready Player One? Yeah. Okay. Talk about like an overinflated like movie full of just so much. I don't know. It's it's almost symbolic of what I think is wrong with a lot of cinema these days, but I think a highlight of why I didn't like Ready Player One is the way that they use the Iron Giant in that movie. Wow. Because the movie kind of comes down to this, oh, last battle thing between the corporation and all the users of this gaming platform. And uh, the I want to say that the corporation is using the avatars of all these IP characters, and Mechagodzilla is one of them, and the Iron Giant... Or no, I don't think the Iron Giant is one of them. But the users, the player base are spawning in all these characters that we know and love to go fight against the corporation's characters. And one of them is the Iron Giant. And then they start using the Iron Giant as a weapon against yeah. this corporation. And it's like, no, I don't think you understood the Iron Giant if you're using the Iron Giant as a weapon. Like, yeah. that's like, like what they should have done is they ha- should have had the corporation be using the Iron Giant as a weapon and 
have that be the uh, the plot device of like, see, these guys don't even respect the IP that they're using, and instead <laughs> they just committed to sin themselves. Yeah, and I did read an article about it when Ready Player One first came out. I had to look it back up to remember as to why. I know that there are a lot of IPs and characters from the novels that they weren't able to get clearance for to use in the movie. Star Wars, for example, there's a bunch of the novel mentioned a bunch of different parts of Star Wars and Disney was not about to let that happen. And I guess what was supposed to be the big fight at the end was Ultraman was going to fight Mechagodzilla. But the Japanese are not ready to license out Ultraman. So instead, Zach Penn and Steven Spielberg said, you know what? Ultraman's in a licensing lawsuit. They're not going to let it out. Steven Spielberg can't convince them otherwise. Let's just use the Iron Giant. So you have a name to be mad at. Zach Penn. Zach Penn is out here licensing the Iron Giant, says, you know what? This will fit. Tall character. We'll use him as a giant weapon. Yeah, so bad. So bad. So, so bad. Well, what do you think is, of the Iron Giant as, as an alien in this, in our alien movie discussion? As a non-biological alien, I think it's great. And I think yeah. if we're just saying alien as unknown, not from this earth, or unknown to us right now, I think it works. Yes. In all honesty, I like watching The Iron Giant more than I like watching E.T., just for rewatch value. I know one has changed culture forever, but this one is definitely more palatable. Way more palatable. And Dean, the junkyard artist, so fun. He's such a fun character. Like, I want to be him. Yeah. It reminded me of the movies that came soon afterwards. Like, I don't know if you ever saw Titan AE. Yeah. Similar animation style, kind of fun, tropey characters. Then we have Atlantis. Then we have Treasure Planet. We have like a bunch of animated movies through the early 2000s that kind of just replay off these tropes. But I think that, yeah, Harry Connick's Dean is really great. Jennifer Aniston as Hogarth's mom is great. Uh, I don't know. Th this one for me tops all those animated movies. Yeah, for sure. Now that we've had a beautiful non-weapon story, <laughs> let's go into the most horrifying and terrifying movie on this list, Annihilation. Wow, what a movie. I remember this was one of the movies that I actually I, I saw uh, early as part of a, the press screening, and I actually wrote a review for this uh, like mm. when I, in 2018 yeah. um, when I was fresh out of college. I really I like Annihilation. I don't think it landed quite as well as Ex Machina did for Alex Garland. In terms of an alien movie, really well done because the whole point of aliens is that they are not us. They're not humans. And so they're so radically different from us that it is hard for us to understand them. And I think Annihilation did a really good job of that. So you saw this at a press screening early. Do you think it is scary? Yes. Thank heaven. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. I you were going to say it wasn't scary. And I'm like, you cannot gaslight me on this one. No, I won't gaslight you on this one. I'll I'll gaslight you on Nope, but this one is terrifying, and it's terrifying because, like, like for Nope, I I don't understand what I mean. Okay, yeah, there's some suspense. Oh, there's something in the sky. Yeah, okay, sure, whatever. To blend to make a bear human hybrid that is simultaneously decaying and speaking with a human voice that isn't necessarily speaking but making noises is horrifying. horrifying. It is. It's unnerving. Like it, it makes your skin crawl because of how familiar it is and yet how alien it is. Yeah, I don't want to knock all the young TikTokers out here making videos about 10 movies you've never seen that are scary. Because I see these lists on TikTok or Instagram. They come up and I'm always like, all right, how old is this kid? How, how do we know? Mm -hmm. That scene always comes up where they're like, I haven't seen this movie yet, but this is scary. It is horrifying. I had just moved to Los Angeles. I was staying in an Airbnb in Van Nuys, kind of rough spot. <laughs> no one spoke English. I had one tiny little lock. None of the lights worked outside of this Airbnb. None of the lights worked inside the Airbnb. There was like one lamp in the room. I'm going to tell you what. Coming home at midnight after seeing this in North Hollywood with three other people in the audience was a terrifying ordeal. That bear was horrible. I went to bed at night. I kept hearing things, and I was like, that thing's going to come to the door. It's so terrifying. <laughs> it was so scary. <laughs> I think this the casting in this movie is amazing. $40 million budget. It made 43. It's about a break-even, whatever. 
but you had Natalie Portman, you had Oscar Isaac for his parts, Gina Rodriguez, Jennifer Jason Lee, Tessa Thompson is amazing in this movie. Yeah. I just, this is a knock. Yeah, he knocked it out of the park on his horrifying camping trilogy number two. Um, <laughs> camping trilogy number two, truly. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And this is based on a book, based on the first book in the Southern Reach trilogy. I had originally thought it was just his idea. But even then, he talks about he read the book, but then he didn't reread it. He just said, okay, I remember the book enough. Let's go write the script. So it's a very loose <laughs> adaptation, which I, I like yeah. that it was just word for word. Yeah, I think obviously I've not read the book, so I don't I don't know I don't know how how well of an adaptation that it is, but in terms of like aesthetics and design, set design and music, even this movie is just it's beautiful to look at. I think it's both beautiful and terrifying because the, the the idea the the premise of the movie is that some kind of alien thing falls through the atmosphere and lands in the Everglades at this lighthouse. And it's creating this field, this projected field around it that they call the shimmer because it kind of looks like the surface of a bubble that's kind of rainbowy and shimmery. And no one, everything that goes in, no one comes back out again. And we, as the movie progresses, we learn that the shimmer is a prism and it's refracting and reflecting and duplicating things on the inside. And the, the characters come to learn that that means DNA as well. So like as they're in the shimmer, the longer they're in it, the more scrambled their DNA is getting with things like trees and houses and plants and sharks. Because there's even a shark alligator. There's like an alligator that has shark teeth in it, which is terrifying. Terrifying. It's terrifying. And well, it's terrifying because this is, it's a really, it's a really on the surface kind of graphic depiction of what it's like to have like cancer or something, just like an unchecked an unchecked growth of cells in your body. And this is kind of a, this is a graphical representation of what that looks like or what that could be like. And as an alien, the whole thing is, we don't know what the shimmer's purpose is. There's gotta be a purpose for it being here. There isn't really, it just is there. And it's just doing its thing at the expense of everything else that it's touching. And that's kind of horrifying. Yeah, I will say the art direction, the... CGI, the props, the sets, they did a great job of taking you into a completely altered world. I wouldn't say it's a completely different world because it's still a lot of it looks familiar. Like, okay, if there's some shimmer set up in Florida, here's how it'd look. But like the little tree wireframes of humans or whatever you want to call that, the, uh -huh. the fact that the plants are then mimicking humans and yeah, all the terrifying <laughs> hybrids and things like that. It all adds to this question of why. And I love that the movie fixates on it without like leaving a bunch of chunky exposition and plot. One note, and this is important because he is in the news right now. David Ellison was one of the financiers of Paramount, one of the producers, or I guess one of the development folks there. He is now in charge of Skydance Media, who is trying to buy Paramount. So he's about to be in oh, charge. Boy. But here comes 2018 David Ellison. He tells Alex Garland and his producer, Scott Rudin, he says, this movie's too intellectual and complicated, and I want you to change it to make it better for a wider audience, including <laughs> making Natalie Portman's character way more sympathetic and less cold, and he wanted the entire ending to be changed. This is why I hate studio folks. Scott Rudin, the producer, said, no up yours, and I have final cut. And therefore, the movie turned out the way it did. And I think that's why this movie will go down and continue to go down as just such a beautiful sci-fi horror film because it was not made for a wider audience. It is meant to be a little more intellectual and leave you with questions, the biggest of which is the ending, which how do you feel about the ending? What is your, not just your take on it, how does it make you feel when you watch it again? It's... You know, it's unnerving is what it is. That final scene where, she, you know, Lena goes into the lighthouse is got to be one of my favorite scenes depicted. Yeah. Everything from her getting there to realizing that like, oh, her husband is not – her husband Kane that she met before is not actually her husband. is actually yeah. like an alien clone to descending into the belly of the lighthouse and then having Ventress kind of dissolve into light who is then having the aliens – weird geometrical mathematical euclidean form take on some of her dna and then become 
a humanoid version of herself. And then they kind of dance around the lighthouse in kind of a, a fight slash sequence so beautiful, so beautifully executed shot, like choreographed, amazing. And then to have her trans transfer to the alien, the his self-destructive human tendency, so that the alien, <laughs> theoretically, the alien destroys itself with a phosphorus grenade, which then creates a fire that burns down the lighthouse and the trees and the, takes the shimmer down. But then to have Lena back in the medical facility, like being questioned, and it's like, oh, that tattoo on her arm. She didn't start the movie with that tattoo on her arm. Like, where'd she get that? And, oh, her eyes are glowing when she's talking to Kane, her, her alien clone husband. What's going on there? And like, oh, there's something weird happening with the water that's next to her. Maybe this isn't, maybe this isn't the Lena we started with. Maybe this is an alien clone. Or maybe this is the Lena we started with, but something so dramatic has happened with her from being in the, in the shimmer that it's not really her anymore. I don't know, dude. It's like... What I what I wish that Nope would have done was held my hand a little bit more, but Alex Garland knows how to not hold your hand and also make it really intriguing. Yeah, especially the bear was horrifying, but this alien shimmer at the end, at least for me, is such an iconic and scary thing. It, it's it's not scary like watching signs or being scared of that alien looks or you know like a horror film like The Thing or something. But it's scary in the unknownness of it all and, and the reflective personality. But yeah, I will say a lot of people point out in discussion of the film, we're getting the whole story from Lena's perspective the whole way through. And it's like, is she an unreliable narrator? Is she the alien? Is she not? Who is Kane? Is yeah, is that the alien? Is it not who she's been talking to? Why did she send out her husband? And how could you cheat on Oscar Isaac? Oh my gosh. On top of it all. <laughs> How could you cheat on him? And then her comments to some of the characters throughout the film. All humans want to be self-destructive. It could be alcohol. It could be solitude. It could be making poor business decisions and credit card debt. But we're all a little self-destructive. And then it makes you wonder at the end, like, wait, did she stick behind? Is this the alien? Yeah, I don't know. Either way. This is a movie I couldn't stop thinking about for way too long. Which, yeah. in my book... Is a good sign of a good movie. Absolutely. Should we wrap it up? Anything else there? No, let me ask you the one question I've asked you with the other two. Okay. So in terms of an alien, how did the alien of Annihilation sit with you? I felt this was the most alien of the three movies we watched this week. Absolutely. This to me feels like iconic, scary, unknowable, if I had to relate it to some movie that they did remake, but they shouldn't have, it was kind of the day the earth stood stillish of just like this iconic unknown entity popping out of something that is iconically scary to us in the media and not knowing how to react to it. And I think this movie hits on all levels of, yeah, scary alien. What about yeah. you? Yeah, no, I think, I think what I am really liking about the alien or like seeing and liking about the alien movie genre is that he, aliens are used as a mirror to, for us to understand ourselves. And that was true with, with Nope. That was true with the iron giant. And I still think it's true for this one because in its alienness, because it was so alien, it, sh it served as a really good mirror for our human characters to discover themselves against as if it was like a backdrop I think I, I really liked that it was you, know, you kind of get the kitschy like Mars attacks alien where it's just like it's just like a, it's just they're just doing human things, which is just war and violence and destruction and terror dressed yeah. up with alien faces. But the shimmer, it's like we don't even know. We don't know. Was it an alien? Was it a natural phenomenon that just happened to hit the Earth? Was it like a dimensional thing? Like no, it was so alien that we're not even sure what was going on with it. And I really like that because that probably rings truer to what, if aliens are real, what aliens would be like, because they would be so non-human that it would be difficult for us to understand it. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of movies like I know our next episode will cover with Independence Day, Cloverfield Signs. A lot of times where the aliens are either attributed to animal-like tendencies and motives or like you said, human-like tendencies and motives. And I do like, especially with Annihilation, but also, I guess, Nope and Iron Giant, there is some amb amb ambiguous room there left to just say it's unknowable. 
And I know there's some movies we're not going to watch or at least discuss, like Solaris with George Clooney or The Abyss that have similar just kind of, we're not really sure why you're here, vibes. But I definitely think of, of all those, Annihilation nails it the most of just leaving the wonder and the fear there and intact without really fully answering it by the end. Yeah, no, agreed. We hope you guys watch these movies. I'll have linked in the show notes where you can stream them right now. And then we will be back again with our third episode of Aliens America coming up July 4th. So until then, watch good movies and TV.